Hi guys and welcome back to Advanced Woodscraft. In this lesson we're going to cover a little bit more in depth. Now in the first ones we talked about how to quick break, how to set up a tarp and rig it up to take it down in a hurry both as a poncho or as a tarp. We also cover how to set camp and take camp down to stack it into our pack so that it comes out in the order that is needed Okay. Now in this one we're going to go a little bit more in depth into the camp itself, the location, the site, etc. Now as you've heard many, many times, location, 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 that means everything. And for us to pick our location, we're going to use the five W's. But understand, the five W's do not necessarily come in this order. The, the importance of a given number, a given letter, may come to the top due to your circumstances. And those five are wood, water, wind, widowmakers, wildlife. If you've got a problem where you've got an angry bear in the area, wildlife may become number one, right? On the other hand, if you're in a very arid place, water may be number one. So you have to adapt on the fly to what your current conditions are and your current needs are. But you run through that checklist, that five checklist, to ascertain. So for, in no particular order, let us begin with wood. What I'm looking for when I'm coming up to the site is I'm looking for a ready supply of firewood that's gonna meet my needs for the entire time I'm here. Now let's say I'm just stopping for a quick lunch this brush pile back here behind me would be perfect for that now, wouldn't it? I can easily take that dry stuff, snap it up, and produce a small fire right quick just to heat up some chow, coffee, something like that, you know. At the same time, if I'm going to be overnight or here two or three days, I would want a larger source. Now, if you look past it, there's quite a bit in here of dead damn limbs and stuff, two or three dead trees I could probably push over right down in there. would be very easy here, so my wood supply would be carried. I do not want to have to carry wood long distance. Although I carry the means to bundle it up, like with jungle knots and things I've talked about in other videos, and make a, a stick to hold it up on my shoulder. Yes, I could, but that's burning a lot of calories. I come to the woods to smooth it, not to get a workout. And so let us just, from the beginning, Pick a site that's close to it. So I identify my wood pile first. There's a source of all the wood I'm going to need for my given activity, how long I'm going to be here. And therefore, I take that this place, and now I start looking around close to that location. Maybe not exactly next to it. Maybe not even want to be next to it. Because, remember, wildlife, a lot of things like to get up into there. You get small animals that like to hide in there from bigger predators you get and of course if you got small animals and you got snakes and things that come there skunks etc they're looking for what's taking refuge in those brush piles and so it can be a wildlife attractor as well as a, war, a food source for you excuse me a wood source for you and so therefore you must bear that in mind given the local area and what I'm facing at the moment okay so let us say we had found wood. The wood must be of a type I'm going to utilize. It's not too punky, not too burnt out, and not too wet. Okay? You got to play with that. It is better to just look around and find the source than find a campsite close to the source. Okay? Much harder to find the perfect campsite. And oh, by the way, it happens to have all these things laying there. It's always going to be a compromise. So that is number one, wood. Number two, again, in no particular order, we're going to talk about water. In certain places of the country, water may be the primary reason because I'm hiking or whatever and i got to refill. I'm going to be cooking, so I want a ready water source very close by. So I may pick the water source, then look for the wood source, combine the two to split the difference, find a place to actually set up my camp in close proximity. I don't mind walking five or ten minutes to a water source as long as I have sufficient method on me to 
to process that water like a grail or a soil water filter or if I'm boiling or whatever and I can get a big enough source of water. Now as I've talked about before, my Blackbird haversack will hold water. And so if I found one that I've got my wood here, I've got my campsite here and the water is a 10 minute walk down there, I may take, as I've said before, dig out a depression in the ground, take the uh, trash bag that I carry for other uses, line that hole and then take everything out of my haversack and use it as a water bucket and transport a couple of gallons at a time up here to fill into that local well, so to speak, and save me having to walk back down to the water source. Perhaps the water source is difficult to get to. You gotta work your way down a steep bank or something like that, or any other obstacles. Those can make me kind of change my mind about being here because how hard it is to get to that water, see? So water is a factor that I'm going to filter into this. Okay. Number three on the list, widow makers. I have found a water source, I have found my wood source, and now I'm going to focus in and look for the physical place I'm setting up my tent, my hammock, whatever way. If I'm gonna be building a bree hut, if I'm just gonna build me a nest up against a tree and lean back for the night. I want to then locate the best place. Now, what is the predominant weather pattern where you're at. That's up to you to find out. Here in my southeast, most of our storms come out of south, southwest, west. Our winter weather is west, northwest, or north, with north being always bone dry air. Any weather that we get coming in from the east is usually rare and fairly fast and where it's being drawn to a big source over here coming in from the west. So a very low pressure cell may draw current from the east flowing to it. But other than that, so therefore, south, southeast, and west are my three directions that I want to have shelter from. So whenever I pick my campsite, do I have a barrier between me and that direction? If I got a wide open field right there, that means wind, rain, and stuff's gonna have velocity when it gets to me. If I moved in 10 or 12 yards into the forest, where that acts as a break for me, as a wind break and as a weather break for me, that could be a better site to pick, plus shade. Again, the seasons. During the summer, I want to be in the shade and avoid the, the sunlight. In the winter, I want to be in the sun as much as possible to keep me warm without having to rely strictly on a fire. Again, all of these points are on a pendulum. Depending on the season, depending on the condition, is how important each one of them becomes to the given moment. And you have to just dial and plug it in. If I am in an area that I've got tons of water and it's gonna be raining, or I can put a drip coming off my tarp and refill my canteens so I do not have to go walk and locate water. I can pick a site that I don't have to really worry about the water now, do I? Consequently, if it's a nice temperature days and I don't really need a fire much, a small debris pile like this may serve me for three or four days because the overnight lows are not going to be anything I have to worry about and the, the daytime highs are where I don't want to fire anyway. So therefore a small debris pile like this would provide all my wood needs. You see how this is subtle and yet complex because each of these points, like chess pieces on a board, each one of those pieces does a different job, moves in a slightly different way depending on the conditions, it can become the most important piece on the board. Very true of us coming out and setting up our camps, okay? So we've dealt with wood, we've dealt with water, and we've dealt with wind. Excuse me, wind. Let's go back to wind a second. With wind, especially in the winter, that can be a big thing. I want to avoid that cold wind. So I want a thicker layer of protection between me and it. Do I need to establish a windbreak, build up a debris pile over here to kind of shield me on the ground pounding? 
or something behind me other than my tarp to help block the wind. On the opposite of that, during the summer, I want to catch that breeze at night because otherwise it's just sweltering down here. And so I would set up looking for that wind, you see. Wind can chill you extremely fast in a winter camp, and it causes you have to burn a much bigger wood pile to try to counteract the effects of that wind blowing over you. So I want to be able to block it off and, and limit it. In the summertime, wind can help you because it's helped keeping you cool and help evaporation of your sweat to drop your temperature and therefore keep you from overheating. Again, the pendulum. Now, Widowmakers. We have selected the site and then we pick Widowmakers. Now, Widowmakers, we have typically always referred to is dead trees, rotten limbs up here that could follow me. That's the big thing, but it's not just that, okay? Let's expand Widowmakers here just a minute. Down here in the south, we have a problem, and several of you have mentioned it as well. We have sinkholes, and we have holes where a tree has rotted out and left a hole in the ground that has become covered over with leaves. We typically call them a chuck hole. It's not a animal like a woodchuck. It, it was a very old southern term. It means you chuck something in a hole. It means a disposable place. It's an unseen danger that whenever you step in it, you'll go up to your, sometimes up to your thigh in that hole. And you're at a full clip and suddenly you drop in a hole, fall forward, and it can break your leg. That would be a Widowmaker. It can, it can leave you trapped out here. So any kind of obstacle or danger that can cause physical uh, damage to me, cause a mechanical injury that means I ain't getting out of here by myself, should be avoided. So I've spotted this place I've got wood, I've got water, I've got a little bit of shade like I want, I've got my the pile over here. That's when I look on the ground, looking for any chuck holes, depression, something where I can injure myself. Then look up, are there any trees, big limbs or something over me that could fall and hurt me? That I need to be aware of. That will adjust my account to make sure it's not going to fall and get me. I'm going to, if there's something out there, well, I can still be here, but I need to mark that somehow. Put a pile of limbs over the top of it where you know what you're looking at, where you're not going to step on it by accident. You get up in the middle of the night and go to nature's call. Is that going to be where I'm going to walk over and step? I can block it. I can mark it. I can sum. That, don't, that ain't a deal breaker. A hole in the ground. A big tree about to fall is. But it, can I mark it? But that is one of the widow makers we don't think of. I myself personally fell into a sinkhole many years ago where I was going through planted pines and there was bushes and stuff and I stepped and suddenly I fell through a hole and I fell 10 foot down into a chamber the size of an 18 wheeler trailer that I had to dig my way back out. I had to cut holes in the bank to make steps to get up to the ceiling to dig my way through the ceiling. It took hours for me to dig back out of there. But Blackie could have just disappeared because I did not see that chuck hole. It wasn't a chuck hole, it was a sinkhole. But I didn't see it, see? And so you gotta be very aware that any obstacle on the ground or in the air could get me. Be aware, okay? Wood, water, wind, widow makers, wildlife. Now, as I said earlier, if you got an angry bear in the area, wildlife may be number one. But don't dismiss this one because this one is really can, can put you in jeopardy. Now, for example, just 100 yards from where I'm standing right now, a couple of years ago, I was doing a review of a product where it was a mosquito net that went all the way around your tarp and turned your hammock uh, and with a tarp over it into like a, a screen house. And I had come down here right before sun up because I had to go to work and so I was gonna do this very quickly. And I had set up the tarp, I had set up my hammock and I'm going around the outside of the tarp hooking this screen to the tarp all the way around. And I'm up here doing the last little pity and I look down and right here at my chest were 70 or more yellow jackets. 
I had set up over a yellow jacket nest and didn't know it. They had stayed in the ground during the night. But now it's warming up. It was a cool morning, but it's warming up. And they woke up and they came out. And the only thing between me and them was that thin little mosquito net. Had I been in the inside, they would have eaten me alive. There was at least 70 of them. It was a patch that big of them just... I walked away. Came back late that night after they'd all gone back in the ground, very carefully took my gear down. And then we marked the nest and took care of it. But a, a yellow jacket nest, if you're allergic to insect stings, or could be because of the sheer volume, those can be a big danger. How about ants? We have fire ants here in the south. A, and fire ants attack as a unit, so they'll swarm up over you and none of them will bite until they get in position and then they'll get the command and all of them go to biting at one time. And so suddenly you're eat up and a second ago you didn't even know you had any ants on you and suddenly they're just lighting you up. That can ruin your day. So I come out here and I have established all the other parameters and now my final thing. Do I see a fire ant mound? That's a big thing here for me. Is there a hole with some with a wasp or something down here flying around it. That's a big indicator of a ground nest of some sort of stinging insect. So be aware as you walk, as you travel, looking for that insect that's just sitting there hovering in one spot. There's a hole. That hole can be no more than big pinky. And there is a wad of yellow jackets down there. So therefore you gotta be aware. So when I'm sitting at my camp, I don't want that to happen. That could ruin my day. Large animals like bear, moose, uh, big deer, things like that, cows even, you know, can give you trouble if you're in a bad position. I spoke in an earlier video when I talked about the Tennessees, about setting up in a place, and the farmer came in and all his cattle stampede through this little area where my tent was sitting, and they just by luck went around me. But they heard the gate unlatch, and here come like 40 head of cattle at a dead run right by me. I don't mean like over there. They were passing on either side of my tent. So therefore, that was a bad decision on my part. So wildlife, are there any tracks around here that's going to indicate to you that? Is there a, being close to that water source, is it kind of swampy, and you're going to get eaten alive by mosquitoes tonight? See? Or have we got tracks showing bear or something cutting through this area? Not just one track, but tracks going back and forth in two directions. That indicates this is a major road for them. It's a major game trail, and you're sitting on it. So you may very well find company during the day or night. So therefore, that fifth W, wildlife, do not underestimate it. If you're someone who's allergic and suddenly you've blundered into a bunch of stinging insects, you've got a problem. Carry proper protection to counteract and get yourself out of there. At the same time, large animals that may not want to play, like a bear or something like that, could be. But in advanced woodcraft, this particular lesson, which I've done before, but I want to put it in this playlist, I want to put it in this set, for the very reason that this is beyond the nuts and bolts of camping. This is almost art. And a woodsman that can come out here and he's, one, screwed up so many times, he's learned, is usually, when you dig deep enough, to come up here and go to pick a site and they just get, watch them. The ones that you respect, the ones that's got time, watch them how they pick a camp. If they come up here and they stop and the first thing they do is they start scanning the ground. looking. They're looking for the insect holes, ants, stuff like that. The next thing is trying to figure out the widow makers and stuff like that. Then they're going to figure out their water sources. All the above before they ever take their pack off. Because if it don't fit my criteria or something I can live with, I'm going to move on. Now also let's talk about an additional that is not covered in this five. But I want you to be aware of. And that's reading the land. Okay? What that means in English is if it is the possibility of rain, and I'm going to be standing right here, 
if it rains hard, where's the water going? Look at the lay of the ground. Notice that shallow depression that's the natural water funnel for that water to go through. Is there a tight V right there coming to my campsite, which was eroded out during a heavy waterfall? Is there right here at my feet, is the dirt kind of got like real fine sand? That'd be silt, and that means this area holds water, and water came in here under a storm and sat here till the water evaporated, which means this holds water like a big mud puddle. It might be 20 foot across, but you wouldn't notice it just walking in, see? Reading the land. Sometimes you gotta literally squat down on your heels and look at the ground at that level and see, I want raised up so water goes away from me. I do not want, so this big hill flows down into my camp. So even though I've, I've picked everything else, but I'm up here and I've got it and I'm in that little bitty depression right there and water runs in from two sides and my I don't leak a drop through my tarp, but the water comes up from the ground level. Been there, done that, it was no fun. And that suddenly all, you wake up in the night and all your gear's wet because you're waking up in a mud puddle. It's flooding up. And since it's so slow, you don't even realize it until you're sopping wet. That's the reason you have to read the land. So, let us recap. Number one, the importance of this list will vary due to your conditions. You already know how to set up your camp in a hurry. You've already got your pack and everything ready to go. Now you're selecting the site itself. What is my biggest concern today when I come into this place? I need water. I need a water source. Okay, so I hunt water before I hunt anything else. Aha, here's my water source. Is it difficult to get down to? No. Now I start spiraling out looking for the campsite. I look for my second. I'm looking for wood. There's water and, okay, there's wood. How far apart is the wood and the water? About 100 yards. And about 40 yards in from the water, there's a good site. So would I want to make a longer walk to get wood or water? Eh, is it worth it either way? So you got to make that determination. Wood, water. This is where the best site. Read the land. If it pours, if it snows, if... What's going to happen right here? Read this address. You know, is it high enough and water's going to run away from me? Or is it in a bottom and water may flow in here on me? Make that reading then. Okay. Wood, water, place looks good. Any wildlife? No. Widowmakers. Insects. Ants. No. Dead trees. One way over there, but it's not an issue. No. Wind. Is this a place I want wind or don't want wind? I'd like a little breeze. It, well, if I shift over about 10 feet between these two trees, I'll get the air coming down that lane right there and I'll get a little more cool air. Now you've selected your camp. Now you take your rucksack off, tie it to the tree, and start setting up your camp. All of this can be done well, as long as you got the mindset and you're running down that checklist, you can do it in a matter of moments as you're walking up. So when your companions are down here in this bottom and your other buddy's over here and this buddy's set up down near the water and he's being eaten alive by mosquitoes all night and your other buddy over here, when it rained that night, he's in a mud puddle. And you're up here between these two trees, high and dry, water sheeting away, your dries all get out, the wind don't bother you, the rain don't bother you, and there's no insects or nothing bothering you up here. That's the mark of a woodsman. It's not the best knife, it's not the best pack. It's this part that's carried up here. The more you carry up here, the less BS you'll carry on your back. Hope you've enjoyed this content, guys. If you have, please hit that like, share, and subscribe button before you go. And there'll be more in this series coming up. Till next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.